Our speaker today is Dr. John Crocker. John is a family physician, author, and speaker who shares lessons learned from his time studying chimpanzees with Jane Goodall in Tanzania. Dr. Crocker is an advocate for the environment and for better understanding of emotional well-being. He combines his experience alongside Dr. Goodall with his 35 years as a family doctor in his book, Following Fifi. John's work has been featured on King Five, the Huffington Post, and the Jane Goodall Institute's news site. He was born and raised in Portland, Oregon, and attended Stanford University, where he met Jane Goodall. John received his MD from Case Western School of Medicine in Cleveland, Ohio. John also has a sense of humor. He has two sons who, he says, occasionally help validate the closeness of chimp and human behavior. I am curious to hear more about that. And a little known fact, Mark Davis is John's brother-in-law. Please welcome to our podium, Dr. John Crocker. You're welcome. Thank you so much, President Kim, for the nice introduction. And I also want to thank Jeff Pryatt for inviting me. It's a pleasure to speak to this group today about highlights of the time I spent working with Jane Goodall, the chimps, and how it influenced my life. I was an undergraduate student doing uh, pre-med at Stanford. And Do you want to help me with the slides? Yeah, just go back to, yeah. If you could go back one. Yeah, I'll let you do that. So I was an undergraduate student and had completed two years of pre-med at Stanford. And I decided just out of the blue to take a primate course. So I signed up and I, I'll never forget walking into this huge auditorium with 300 people and seeing Jane Goodall up close at age 37 showing these beautiful National Geographic films of her right close up to the chimps. I was interested in child development, so I really you know, keyed into the, to the part where mothers were raising their infants. And I have a very short clip to show you right now of that. Okay? Because of the trust established in camp, tracking the chimps in the forest was now much easier for Jane. She was able to follow and document in detail the development of Flo's infant son, Flint. At six months, Flint is learning to ride on his mother's back. But sometimes he doesn't get it quite right. At around the same age, he takes his first tottering steps. When he stumbles and whimpers, Flo quickly rescues him. Flo is a particularly affectionate, tolerant, and playful mother. And because much maternal behavior is learned, she is the role model for her daughter Fifi. As Flint grows older, Flo permits Fifi to take him for brief periods of time. Such experiences provide important training for the future when young females mature and have offspring of their own. When I left the lecture hall, I was so excited to see this behavior right up close and thought of this adventure. And that was compounded. I was so excited two months later to hear that Jane Goodall would be taking two students every six months with her to speak or to um, uh, work with the chimps. Next. So I was a pretty ordinary college guy. I was a little bit shy, growing a beard, trying to find myself. And um, I thought about the possibility of applying, but I would have to delay medical school. Or the other choice would be to return to the library cubicles, where I was memorizing organic chemistry compounds. <laughs> so I applied. 
And it was during the application process that I was really forced to think about why I wanted to do this. In the interview, I talked about growing up in Oregon in a very supportive family, but there were some pretty major tensions that I felt affected my self-esteem and my confidence later in life. But that really instilled in me a strong desire to try and understand the basic components that are necessary in any growing primate, whether it's human or chimp, to assure that given the genetics, they would turn out to be confident and competent adults. And as it turns out, Jane's interest in this study really did revolve around mother-infant relationships and how that panned out. So I had a year, I was very excited to hear that I, I was accepted, and I had a year to prepare to learn Swahili, to um, learn the names of the uh, chimps and the faces, to learn calls and know what they meant, the pantoots, the hoo, 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 and so all that I had to learn, but really, thank you, the, what helped me more than anything else, next slide, was this guy, Babu. He was a two-year-old chimp who was orphaned in West Africa. Poachers probably shot his mother and took him, and they were selling him for chimp meat in a market. And this really nice older couple saw this, and they bought him so that he wouldn't become a steak dinner and brought him back to their home near Stanford. So I um, was asked to help out. Babu, at two, he was six months at the time, and by two, he was getting aggressive, which is normal for a chimp. And so they wanted some help, and they heard I'd be working with chimps with Jane Goodall and thought I knew a lot about chimps, which I didn't. But I agreed to take him on little outings, and I would travel in my Mustang, old beat-up Mustang, with Babu to get him out of the house so that they would have time to fix up the house, you know, repair things that were damaged and do errands and things like that. And when I first took off with him, I was very worried that Babu would uh, get lost, he'd run off, he'd break into a house or injure someone. But in fact, it was just the opposite. He was so aware of where I was that if I started to move off, he would whimper and run after me. In the wild, chimps are extremely dependent on their um, mothers for nine or ten years until they go off on their own they nurse for four to five years. So it's this long period, which is very important because they have to learn how to build a nest, which is very complicated, to fish for termites, to learn the socialization. And so Babu was just like that, and I was his caretaker. One day we were at a park, and he was way up in the trees doing his acrobatics, and I was down below. Children were playing in the playground below him, and a dog barked. He became, you know, really nervous and upset, so he came running down across the playground and leaped into my arms and just started hugging me. And that embrace, you know, I could feel him just tightly squeezing my ribs. And I knew he would do that for five minutes or so until he was reassured enough to go back to his acrobatics. And during the time that I was walking around, I had his bottles and bananas and pampers and he was clinging to me. And one of the dads who had a daughter there just slowly walked up to me and he, he kind of stopped and he looked at me and he just said, you sure have an ugly kid there. And in fact, it was my first feelings of, of fatherhood, but I knew that was ending soon because I had to go to Africa. So after a year together, our last time together was actually really sad. I had big tears in my eyes as I left him. And as I was driving away, I thought of how ironic it was that Babu would be going off to Stanford to be in a compound with other chimps while I went off to Africa to see what his life would have been like had he been left in the wild, okay? So I flew 12,000 miles off to Equatorial Africa, East Africa, to a very remote area, okay? And the area is um, along, you can switch, to the shores of Lake Tanganyika. The valleys are very fertile valleys, rich with fruit trees, lots of uh, insects and birds and animals. And they live in an area that's protected 10 miles along the shore by three miles up to the Rift Mountains, which is part of the Great Rift Valley. Next. So I, this was my home for eight months. Um, I had never been camping before, so this is my first camping trip. And I was terrified the first few weeks. There were all sorts of animals that I didn't know were out there, and neurotoxic snakes next that could go through the screens and into my hut. But I actually found really soon, like within three or four weeks, this confidence and this joy of being connected to nature 24-7. I would follow the chimps from sunrise to sunset, have my dinner on the beach, and then I would return to this hut where I could feel the breeze, I could smell things, I could 
feel these the bush pigs bumping up against my, my walls, which gave me company, and heard the crickets. One night, I, the door blew open in a storm, and I was frightened, but I thought, you know, if the chimps can survive high up in the trees, I could survive in this metal aluminum hut. And this was my view across Lake um, Tanganyika to Zaire, the um, Congo on the other side. So Jane was my mentor. In this picture, I was 22, she was 39. And you know, she was a pretty famous scientist at this time. And I felt such awe. I was also intimidated initially. I thought, oh, I'm going to say the wrong thing, or she's going to find out I really am not qualified to be there. But in fact, she had a really big interest in her students. And I think it was really nice for her to have students around. She was busy raising a son in a research center, visiting faculty. And so I think um, the, the camaraderie was a very tight community. That, and I learned so much. I really appreciated how she articulated her thoughts. When she spoke, images would light up in my mind right away. And if some of you have heard her talk, you know how she gives examples and anecdotes. She also is really good about empowering people around her. She motivates. And um, I was so lucky just to spend this time. It helped shape my worldview, how I looked at life. Some of you know Jane always wanted to go to Africa and study big animals. So after high school, she worked really hard to get enough money for a boat ticket to East Africa, where she met famed archaeologist and anthropologist Louis Leakey. And together on the, in the Olduvai Gorge, they were digging up fossils of early humans, Australopithecus. And Louis Leakey saw in her this determination, this endurance, intelligence, curiosity. And because she had never had scientific training, he thought she'd be perfect to go off to this area where chimps were spotted, where she ended up starting her study. And so against all odds, being a female, being single, going off with just her mother and a field assistant. She started in 1960, which was the um, area, Gombe, G-O-M-B-E, the Gombe National Park. And this became the longest study of mammals in the world and, of course, made her famous. Um, the community was very, we were very close. We all watched out for each other. And when I followed, I went with a field assistant. I became really close. I could talk for an hour about this, but they became some of my closest friends ever. And 35 years after I left, I went back and reunited and just got to see what their life was like. So chimps develop along the same lines as humans. In fact, the DNA of a chimp is only 2% different than the DNA of a human. This is 17-year-old Satan. Um, he's actually a really nice chimp, so the name is a little misleading. But um, so he's fully mature. The next one shows Hugo, who's um, 48 or 50. And they live to be 40 or 45 in the wild, older in captivity because they're vaccinated. And that's about the age of humans in 1900 around the world, the average age. Fifi is here. I don't know if that shows, oops, okay, I'll let you do it. <laughs> go ahead. Um, Fifi is the one, if you go back. Fifi is lying down on the left and looking up. Occasionally, she'll reach out and, and touch Freud. And Freud has a play face, that uh, 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 as opposed to a fear grin. <laughs> so you can tell they're playing. And the mothers hung out together with infants the same age. So I was in charge of tracking uh, four mothers from sunrise to sunset and watching their behavior. Uh, Fifi was very patient, very present, just like her mother was. And for me, to, to start the first day and see Fifi and have her not even look at me, I mean, she'd been followed since age one. She probably wondered why these people were, you know, standing there looking at her. And it was such a nice feeling because Jane had spent all this time to habituate the chimps. And I felt like such a guest being there and being so close up. Okay. The bond is so close between the mother <clears throat> and the infant that if a mother dies, the infant struggles. This is a four-year-old who was luckily adopted by the older sister. But Flint, who was eight years old and could fully make his own nest and get his own food, when Flo died, and you saw Flo in that picture, the first film, um, he became so distraught. And he touched her body next to the stream where she was laid dead and touched her and screamed and would run off. And he wouldn't eat, wouldn't socialize. And he died three weeks later. Well, there's a lot of things to learn, a uh, young chimp growing up, and one of them is termiting. I'll show you a very quick film of termiting. But baboons can only capture the termites outside the nest. 
as the swarms emerge and fly. But the chimps not only know termites are there, hidden below the surface, they have learned how to get at them. In defense of their nest, the termites grip onto the grass. And with utmost care, the chimp gently draws them out. I did that, good. So, males are very efficient at age five in doing this. Anybody wanna guess females, how old they are when they're efficient? Yeah, two and a half. And when you are at the termite mound, you see the youngsters around doing this and copying. You'll see females reaching out and grabbing the arm of their mother and patiently, real carefully watching and trying it and very gently looking at it. And the males will have their tool, their stick, but they'll be hitting each other with the sticks. <laughs> And that's actually their training to become a protector of the troop later on. So the males have a hierarchy. Not, not yet. The males have a hierarchy. Uh, this is Figgin, who's the alpha male. And he um, would patrol the, you know, the perimeter. He was very um, vigilant. And he'd have these ferocious displays. They fight to get this hierarchy where there's the alpha male and on down. But once the fighting is done and they have their, their place, then there's no fighting. But there are these constant practicing of these displays because they have to show who's boss and they also have to um, main, you know, practice for predators. And if Figgin were like hyped up all the time with adrenaline going, cortisol high, he'd get heart disease, his immune system would, would run down. So he has to learn to settle really quickly. So he's got these bursts of energy, but he has to settle. And the next clip will show you how this all fits together. Another group's arrival is signaled by a chorus of hooting calls. Adult males dominate chimp society and are much preoccupied with their position in the hierarchy. In an effort to better his rank, the male puts on an awesome charging display. <laughs> With hair bristling and vegetation flying, the male makes himself appear larger and more dangerous than he actually is. Intended to intimidate rivals, it is usually nothing more than superb bluff. One infant male already has the idea, but not yet the coordination. After displays of aggression, the dominant chimp often reassures those who have been frightened or hurt, and thus tension is diffused, harmony restored. One male rose to the top of the hierarchy by intelligence rather than strength. Mike discovered that rolling empty kerosene cans from Jane's camp made a horrifying noise. There's a, there's a group of uh, chimps, or a species called bonobos, some of you know about. And they're matriarchal. They don't have all this aggression and all this, these displays. And we think it's because they lived in a very particular part of the Congo in Africa where they didn't have big predators. So there, there's a lot of collaboration, a lot of female in the leadership and child rearing is, is, is shared. So it's very interesting and they're very, very closely related to to humans. After this, oh, that's just me in a nest. I'll see if anyone wants to ask any questions later about that, the chimp nest. So after this experience, I went to medical school, residency, and started practice as a family doctor in Seattle, seeing, delivering babies, seeing kids and old people. And I really thought a lot at the time about Fifi. 
I didn't have kids at my own, of my own when I started, so I could sort of reflect on the nurturing, that the basic needs of any primate, whether it's human or chimp, and I felt more confident giving advice to parents and about nurturing and that sort of thing. I also saw, you can switch there, to um, a lot of anxiety and depression, as most family doctors do. And I just wanted to give you one example. Robert, who came to me with, ex he was a 31-year-old in the maritime business, and he came to me with a lot of anxiety. He was in tears when he described commuting to work for an hour and a half in rush hour traffic, then sitting behind a computer terminal, and then coming home in rush hour traffic and living alone in an apartment. And he um, probably was wired similar to, to Figgin in some ways. He had a, a gene that for him made him more susceptible to anxiety. Some of us are calm and some of us are a little more, get more worked up. But I, I thought of Figgin if he was strapped in a car in the seatbelt driving to work, what that would be like for him and how Figgin would get this out. He'd, you know, he was calm because he was connected to nature. He, he moved and Robert didn't. So there's lots of good medication for this when th there's extreme anxiety that it's not habit forming, but Robert really wanted to do this au natural. So we set up some breathing techniques, relaxation techniques and therapy and stuff, but we also designed a 20 minutes a day, he would get vigorous exercise. I mean, this was required. And on the weekends, he would go out in nature because we know that our connection with nature helps with anxiety also. And it was really fun to see him go through this. So that was an example of how I sort of looked at things from an evolutionary perspective. And I think sometimes knowing where our behavior comes from or why it's there is, is important. Another example is ADHD. Carl came to me at age eight. Most of us know attention deficit disorder because we know a friend or a relative or someone that has it, we might have it ourselves. And you know, it's a, it's a tough thing, but for me, when Carl came in at age eight, and we knew before I even walked through the door that he had it because the questionnaires were filled out by teachers and parents. And he, he was right up there. And to see him in the exam room, you know, fidgeting and as he talked and I tried to get a history, reach out for the otoscope and kind of disruptive. But his energy was also really cool. I said, what do you like? And he jumped off the table and he said, Star Wars. And he took out his lightsaber and, you know, he's a great kid, you know, eight-year-old. And so I thought of the alpha male Frodo, the most successful alpha male ever, Frodo, who had classic ADD or ADHD. And he was impulsive. He was very quick to respond. He couldn't sit still and wait his turn at the termite mound, but he was physically an incredible hunter. And so I kind of looked at this packaging of ADHD in our evolutionary wiring, and it certainly was important that some community members had it to, for survival of the species. And um, in Carl's case, he definitely needed um, Ritalin to go back to the classroom. If he were in a different setting, maybe not, but he needed it. But I think what else was really important was to have the teachers and the parents recognize in this young kid that with impulsivity comes creativity. And with this, you know, inattentiveness comes thinking outside the box. And so in addition to the medicine, all of the people around him were, were really working hard to bring out the positive aspects of this and to support him. And, and that was, so, and, you know, with all this, I, I, I just loved looking at things from, uh, survival genes and, and how that worked. And I would even visualize like Robert, the one with anxiety, in a medieval castle, um, a guard with all this vigilance and anxiety going up and down ladders to let off steam and guard the castle. So I sort of had fun in my practice, I think because of the result of spending so much time with the, with the chimps. In my own family, we, we didn't um, have too many tight controls over letting off steam, okay? And I did go back 35 years later with my son, which was kind of completing the circle. And we saw, next one shows, um, reuniting with some of the um, field assistants, okay? And that's Hamisi who brought with him the next picture, which shows what we were like. He had saved this picture of the two of us. So to summarize, from Fifi, I learned about patience. I think all of us that have had kids or um, raising kids know that in the twos and the teens, it, it's really important. From, um, from Jane, you can go back. From Jane, I learned about perseverance. It took me 10 years to write this book. 
And I thought about Jane. I almost quit. She almost quit when she first started um, observing the chimps. And I thought about her as I was writing this. The next. And Jane, I went to her. We're still good friends. This was at her 85th birthday this year in Chicago. It's a fundraiser for her uh, Roots and Shoots, which I'll talk about. So when Jane first um, came to Africa, there were a million chimps across equatorial Africa. And now there's 250,000. She knew in the late 80s that if she really wanted to protect the chimps, she had to go on the road. Right now, today, she travels 300 days a year lecturing. She gets a standing ovation before and after she talks. And she's a rock star to young women and men that see her as this incredible role model. I think her legacy is going to be Roots and Shoots, which is this organization for young people throughout the world, 8,000 chapters throughout the world. And this is an environmental education program for students to learn about the environment hands-on. They actually participate in something and they see the results. It's just amazing. And if Jane were here, I think she would, I know what she'd say. I've seen so many of her talks, and I always walk out of these talks feeling like I want to go out and change the world. But she would say, she would look out at the audience and she'd say, um, each of you can make a difference. And um, in this case, I know you're all making differences anyway, but she would say that to people. She'd say, um, each of you can make a difference, and you can choose what kind of difference that would make. And as you see opportunities coming, take those opportunities and, and go with it. And in her life, she certainly did. So thank you very much, and I'll answer questions. Thank you. Be happy to take questions. All right, we have a question from Jeff. All right, oh good, Jeff, great. Thank you, um, and thanks for validating my existence with the whole ADHD <laughs> talk. Sure. How, how does that relate, talk a little bit more if you would about the relationship between ADHD and when you and I had spoken you talk about you talked about leadership and you talked about different people and all that kind of stuff. Could you expand on that a little bit please? On, on ADHD and leadership? Well, and, and how we get to where we are in the world, you had, you had gone oh, on yeah. for quite a yeah. while. Yeah. Well, I think where we are in the world is a, is a really good uh, point to make. And I think our genes have, um, are here because they helped us at one time in history. Maybe this is going to answer your question. Um, but I think in the modern world, you know, we have to understand these genes and adapt. And that's, I think, a, a really tough situation right now because I think... As the world gets smaller, we need to um, look at more bonobo than chimp in terms of collaboration versus, you know, aggression. And so, so knowing where our behavior, the roots of our behavior, really helps us. In, in terms of ADHD, there are many people who have been incredible leaders. You can le read a list of people who have had ADD in, in history and artists and just amazing people. So I think honoring um, a, a condition like that that comes packaged with all these other things is, is really, really important. And for me, I, I got interested in how this packaging happens. Am I getting at your question? Yeah. And so um, Richard Rangham, who studied male behavior, he thought for sure that um, if the human race is to be maintained on this earth and all the ecosystems that um, that the ability to, um, to collaborate becomes even more important as we move ahead. But to understand why we have this aggression is really other, important. Another question here. First off, I just want to say thank you for your talk. And it was really informative and really interesting. Thank you. And I was just curious, in your experience in studying chimps, and presumably you are probably somewhat familiar with bonobos too. Uh, how much of chimp and how much of bonobo do you see in humans? And what kind of percentage would look best in terms of optimal human behavior today, in your opinion? All bonobo. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, it's always interesting to know, well, first of all, the, it's a really good question, and I don't even know if, in terms of how closely we're related to bonobos versus chimps. It's a really good question. If you look at the DNA, the three groups are very tightly. The chimps and humans and bonobos and humans are closer than chimp is to gorilla or bonobo is to gorilla. So it's a really close relationship. 
And um, I think the um, answer, so, so you asked about um, bonobos and, and chimps, and t tell me again just what your basic question was there. Right. But in terms of other aspects of chimp behavior that perhaps differs from bonobos, uh, what kind of percentage do you think is best to emulate? Like 80% bonobo, 20% right. yeah. chimp, or I would just go, 100%? I, I would go high on bonobos. You know, Jane Goodall witnessed this attack of the males in her community that went to another community and it was gang warfare. They annihilated all the males in that um, group. And after this happened, it was over a two-year period. It's never happened again. But for some reason, they went down, and then they took the females and young. And, joined, and So maybe they took over their territory. It was gang warfare in the chimps. And so Jane's comment was, I used to think chimps were nicer than humans, and now I don't think so. So I think that if you looked at <clears throat> the bonobos are getting a lot of attention because they use sensuality. They use their bodies for... Um, decreasing tension and it's it's kind of like meditating or, or yoga and that sort of thing so I think that we can learn a lot from that and I um, but I think it's still really important to know that we're still pretty closely related to chimps too and so we have this gene for aggression it's there because we had to survive we had to fight the enemies and we had to do that so we just have to learn how to control it in today's society and I think there's many leaders men and women who do this in a very and have done it, we've seen leaders that we really respect that can collaborate and that can bring people together and motivate and make them feel powerful, the people around them. And I think that's what we see in, in all primates. We, we try to understand that and where to go with that. Okay, we have a question for President Kim. All right. John, can you please say more about the 2% difference? Between yes. Well, when you look at, you know, the brain of a chimp is pretty different from humans. They don't have a, it's smaller, quite a bit smaller, and there's no um, language center. So the, the brain is different, but the DNA that produces our proteins, it's pretty similar to ours. And they get the same diseases. There was a polio, polio epidemic that spread from humans to chimps and almost wiped out the, the whole um, group of, of primates. So the DNA is very similar if you look at the amino acids and the proteins produced. It also brings up, you know, when you look at the genetics, it, there's a really exciting field called epigenetics. And that's, yeah, ep epigenetics is the um, idea, it's, the, it's proven that the genes we have can be made, they make um, higher amounts of certain proteins and less based on environmental exposures. So our epigenetics, it's like a little, um, asterisks over the gene. We, we're born with the genes, but how those are expressed can be changed by starvation, by um, war, by all sorts of things. And then, once that changes, that can be passed on to the next generation. So it's like a fast Darwin track. So epigenetics is being studied closely in terms of how that affects us, too. And um, I think that's going to be a really, you know, genes are kind of where, where it's at in terms of research right now. Uh, Dave? I'm curious about the slide that you referred to where you're laying in the nest and what the, <laughs> and, and what the story you. is behind okay. that slide. Thank you. Well, so I really regretted not being able to be with the chimps 24-7. I, I didn't really want to stay all night with the chimps. But one night, I decided the chimps were in a different valley, and three of us went out and we found chimp nests. Mine, unfortunately, was a small nest built by an adolescent. So, But I was 40 feet above the ground and hanging out over this cliff. I didn't sleep, it was, hor it was a horrible experience, but at least I did it, and I knew what it was like for chimps to be up in the, in the nest. Mm -hmm. yep. Question from Jim. You mentioned Louis Leakey, the uh, mm -hmm. famed archeologist who started Jane Goodall on her quest. He also identified Diane Fossey yes. and Baruti Galdikas for uh, gorillas and right. orangutans. The trimates. Yeah. And my question, though, is uh, in terms of the work at Gombe, who is carried on now after uh, Jane has um, left the field research right. aspect? The, the Stanford involvement ended just soon after I was there. There was a kidnapping, an international crisis, where they took three to four students and held them hostage. It was horrible, so they quit the Stanford involvement. 
So then other researchers started in, and now the Tanzanians are actually running it. There are people who come and do research, but these Tanzanians who are just so sharp at identifying the chimps and they know behavior, they're speaking English now and Swahili, and so they're running the show. Jane goes a couple times a year to check on things, and uh, Anthony Collins is um, head of it. He's a, a Scottish guy who, who runs it. But it's run by, a lot by the Tanzanians, and they're carrying on work. People still go and do research. You all can go if you want. <clears throat> um, there are places to stay on the beach, even in Jane's house. It's hard to get to, and it's, it's kind of an ordeal. But um, actually, someone in the audience has done this. Someone that I saw. Yeah, in the back. Yeah. So. Um, so people can actually go and see, see the chimps. But it's being carried on by the Tanzanians, and we have records of these chimps now. Like Fifi, I found out after I left that she had eight offspring. Usually it's three or four. And out of those eight, of the five males, three were alpha males, unheard of. And so, you know, there's a different father with each one. The, the mating is um, pretty promiscuous, and so she, they all of these eight infants probably had different fathers. But the common, what, the common link was um, Fifi's genes plus the way she nurtured them. And so it was pretty impressive. I think the confidence, Fifi's confidence. That's why I was so interested in this book, writing this book and getting it out. Um, and, and the book's been fun. I've been able to travel a little bit. It's going to be published in China in the spring. Um, and I got this note saying from the Chinese publishing company that the, um, the readership has a more a bigger interest in nature now, which is really kind of neat to hear. So, Jaime. Uh, thank you for your time. One and minute. I'm curious, with 98% of the genetics compared to humans, what is their diet like? You said in the 1900s yeah. they, they live in a similar lifespan as us. and Their you know, diet. Yeah. Yes, it's really good. I've tried to mimic it. A lot of fruit, real fibrous fruits. They eat fruit all day long. It's so fibrous they have to eat like mothers eat for seven hours to get enough nutrition. Um, and then they, they fish for termites for protein, very important. And they kill once a week. They kill a little baby colobus monkey, not another chimp, but a colobus monkey. So there's a little bit of meat, but mostly it's you know birds' eggs and roots and shoots and it's vegetarian. It's highly, highly vegetarian with lots of roughage. That's their diet. And the um, protein comes in little little packets, but it's not a lot of protein. And they're so strong. Females can climb a, a tree with uh, their hands, up palm fronds, with an infant attached. And males, I mean, they're three to five times stronger per body weight. A male weighs 100 pounds and is three to five times stronger than a 100-pound man. OK, we have one short question. <laughs> Uh, John, thanks a lot uh, yes. for coming. I, I, I actually had lunch with Jane, and uh, oh. do, you, do you know what her schedule is today? Is she still traveling the world? I mean, 300 I days a year. And she, um, she flies, she talks, she raises money. It's amazing. At 85, her mind is so good. She's still writing. You know, after a busy day, she'll take a little swig of whiskey to get to sleep, and then she's, she's set. It's so great. She is, and she's vegetarian. She is a yeah, vegan, yeah. in fact. And um, her life is so full, she, I think she feels like there's this timeline for her and that she's it's running out, you know, her time is running Thanks out. Thanks for sharing it with us. Yeah, she's great. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot.